Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. The last thing we're going to discuss are something called zero force members. Now this is the secret to all trust questions in the exams. No matter what university, this is going to be the secret right here. Because zero force members allow us to take very complex looking trusses and simplify them. Because there is two relationships that we can use to determine if a member in a truss is zero force or basically it carries no load. So again, there's going to be two cases. The first one is if two members meet at a joint without any external load. Now, if this is the case, both of those members that meet at the joint are zero force. They carry no load. So if this was my case here and I had my joint, which is the purple dot, and I had my two forces from the members, I can automatically conclude without any calculations that both of these are zero force, meaning that both F1 and F2 are equal to zero. Now you guys are looking at this and saying, all right, Clayton, I, it's, it's easy, but how the hell did you determine that? Well, it's simple. The idea of equilibrium. So if I were to set my x-axis as parallel with F1 here, because you can do that. You guys can set the x-axis however you want, as long as they're perpendicular. So one thing that students always forget is that they always have it as horizontal and vertical. But if I wanted to, I can rotate it. It's completely fair game to rotate it. Now, if I were to do this, and I were to go summation of forces in the y direction, well, we can see that F1 has no component. It's perfectly in the x-axis. So my only component, of course, is going to be something times F2, or that something is just a factor. Now, if this is the case, and I want to uphold equilibrium, we know that this is equal to zero. So something times F2 equal to zero, well, the only way this is going to be possible is if F2 is equal to zero. And if F2 is equal to zero, then F1 must also be equal to zero. So there's the first case. The second case is if two, sorry, if we have three members that meet at a joint, again, with no external load, and two of the members are collinear, meaning that they're parallel with each other, and the third member is non-collinear. That third member is actually a zero force member. Now again, this is a bunch of word garbage. If you guys want to see what this looks like, it would look something like this. So notice how my two top members are parallel with each other, so they're collinear, and then I have a third member that is not collinear. If this is the case, then that third member is actually going to be zero force. And from there, I can say that, all right, we have F1 and F2, and they're going to be equal to each other, but not zero. Well, this F3 is actually going to be equal to zero. And the proof for this one is just the same as before. If I were to go summation of forces in the y direction, well, my only force in the y direction is F3, so it must be equal to zero. Now, you guys are saying, okay, Clayton, it's pretty easy to see these two cases. But what is the importance of this? Well, again, it helps simplify our questions. So if we identify and remove these zero force members, our trust questions actually become rather simple. Give me an example, no problem. This is a trust that I love to give to students as an assignment, because if we look at this trust, it's pretty gross. It has 11 members in this trust. Now, I always ask the students, give me every force in this trust. And they look at that and say, excuse me, Clayton, every force, 11 forces, are you kidding me? That's crazy, I don't wanna do that, that's a lot of work. But the trick to this trust is it has a lot of zero force members. So if we were to look at our two cases, all we have to do to identify them is just go through each joint. So if I were to look at, oh, and we have a force P at the end. So if I were to look at this joint over here, automatically it does not fall into two of the cases because it's going to have support reactions due to the pin. Notice that both of these cases, there can't be any support reactions or external loads. So I can conclude that this joint right here, I can't do anything. This joint can't do anything. And this joint, I also can't do anything because we have that external load at all three of these joints. Now, if I were to go to the other joints and kind of work my way through, not a lot actually happens. If I were to look at this joint, well, we have four members, so it doesn't fall into any case. If I look at this joint, I have four members. So again, doesn't fall into any case. This joint, four members, no case. But when we look at this joint, we have three members. Now, if we look at case two, it talks about three members. And it says that the only qualification that we need is that two of the members are collinear. And if we look here, those top two members, they're collinear. Therefore, that third member must be zero force. So if we look at this, 
I can say that that member in there is going to be zero force. You guys are saying, Clayton, we just went through all the joints and we just took out one member. The, how, how's that helping anything? Well, here's the trick to zero force members. You have to do more than one pass. You can't just go through it once, identify what you can and say, yep, that's it, that's all. Because if we were to look at these joints now that we took away a member, things start to change. For instance, if I were to look at this joint down below, which before had four members, so we couldn't do anything. Well, now after we took away that member that goes vertical, it now has three members. And if we look at case two, it says that if two of the members are collinear, then the third one is zero force. And if we were to look here, those two diagonal members, well, they're collinear. So in this case, we can say that because of case two, this member is actually zero force. And then the same thing now with this joint. Before it had four members, couldn't do anything, but now it has three. And as we can see, the top two are collinear. So therefore, this joint is also equal to zero force. And then hold on one second. If we go to this joint now, it now has three members. There, two of them are collinear. So this is actually going to be zero force. So again, the trick here, we need to do multiple passes. You can't just go through it once, say you're done. You have to go through it once and then go through it twice. And every time you remove a member, you have to recheck all the joints. So if we look at this, it was 11 members before, but now we actually simplified it to the following. Now it still looks like it's seven members, but remember that these members right here from equilibrium, they're going to be equal to the same. If I look at the case two above after I remove F3, well, we know that from horizontal equilibrium, F1 must be equal to F2. So what I highlighted there in blue, that's essentially just one member. And then the same thing with the diagonal one. So we basically took a case where we had 11 members we had to solve for, and now we only have to solve for three. So this is, again, the beauty of zero force members is that it takes our very complex truss and simplifies it, which makes all of our calculations much easier. Now, if you guys wanted to, you guys can still solve for all 11 members and the math will show you that those are all going to be zero force. The math still works out. But again, the name of the game in finals and midterms and any exam is speed. Remember that cars from Disney, I am speed. That's what you guys should be doing before the exam is giving yourself that little pep talk. Because in exams, again, the number one killer is that students don't finish on time. If I were to do 11 calculations, that's going to take up a lot of my time. If I were to do three, well, it's probably still going to take a lot of time, but it's going to be a lot less than 11. So again, this particular lecture, I'm just showing you guys kind of the fundamentals of trusses. In the next two lectures, we are going to start discussing how do we solve for these forces inside of the truss. Yeah, that's it for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you guys in the next lecture video.